What's up, everyone? This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. This week, I interview the voice of Ramwad, Daniel Head. In my first interview with the Ramwad guys, I interviewed Ryan Schultz and Jeremiah Head. We had an amazing conversation, but uh, a few times when I would ask more technical questions, they kept telling me, uh, you need to talk to Daniel, you need to talk to Daniel. He's he's kind of the guru behind, uh, behind the whole program. And so in this show, we dive into a lot more of the technical and, and scientific pieces of recovery, flexibility, mobility. Um, and Daniel is just a phenomenal guy. I've gotten the chance to know him over the past couple of years. He has a huge heart. Um, he just wants to help others and he is a very knowledgeable human being. So, uh, tons to learn from this before we get started. If you've been listening to this show for a while and haven't done so already, please throw this show on pause, head to iTunes, leave me a quick review. If you have a question that you want answered related to health and fitness, mindset, business, et cetera, please don't hesitate to call in. Um, I absolutely love being able to connect with you guys and answer your questions or having friends of mine that are experts help me answer your questions. So if you're interested, call into the hotline at 801-449-0503. That's 801-449-0503. Enjoy the show. What's up, everyone? This is Mike Cashew, and you're listening to the Brute Strength Podcast. Today, I am interviewing Daniel Head, the voice of Ramwa. Daniel, thank you so much for making some time to do this, brother. It's been, oh. uh, I've been wanting to do this for a while, and, and I'm glad we finally connected. No, absolutely. Uh, thanks for having me. This is fantastic. So when, when, in the, when you guys were thinking up... Um, you know, thinking of creating Ramwad, when did you realize that you were going to hit a home run because of your sultry voice? <laughs> it, you know, it was, uh, it was interesting in the early days, like you said, it was, we, we didn't really know how it would actually be received, but we, we knew there was something definitely special about it. And as far as, you know, the voice goes, it was that, that was definitely I guess a surprise for me and a surprise for as far as, you know, the, how I was going to play into the, the audios and the routines. I don't think I was expecting that, that to necessarily take mm-hmm. as it has. So, yeah, I don't know if I ever really kind of <laughs> realized it, <laughs> to be honest. I figured y'all had it. I, yeah. was, just, I was just messing yeah. with you. Oh, man. But you have, a, you have a perfect voice for it, man. Oh, thanks. Um, so on the last show, I was with Jeremy and Ryan, and yes. we talked about, you know, kind of the – creation of Ramwad and and the fact that you I think it was you and Jeremy initially kind of were talking about the fact that crossfitters just needed needed something to recover right there was this yeah. big need in the community and you were already you had been practicing and teaching yoga for many many years and y'all had the idea to you know start teaching yoga to crossfitters Right. Um, so I'm wondering, why did you base it all off of yin yoga rather than the other, I don't know how many, there are probably uh, so dozens many, right? of others. Oh, right? yeah. Why, why yin tons. yoga versus the others? You know, it was, we, we have a, a vinyasa based studio for so many years. And so as, as the CrossFit hit the scene and my brother has a CrossFit that literally was two doors down from our yoga studio, we kept getting a lot of the athletes coming into our studio and they were looking for that extra stretching ability. They were looking to how to really increase their mobility and, and try to find a better recovery. And what we found is that it wasn't really, I guess, satisfying their needs to recover properly and to open themselves properly. And instead it was actually just more of another workout. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the vinyasa style is definitely more, I guess, physical based in some ways at least for a majority of the time that you're in the class. And and on top of that, the classes are an hour and a half. Right. So it was this recipe of, you know what, we're overstretching the back of their body. They were getting really warm because it's based on vinyasa, which is also kind of cultivates a warmth and a heat and repetition. There are a lot and of they, like isometric holds in that practice. Lot, right? There's a lot of isometric and a lot of just, you know, you're flowing and you're moving. Mm-hmm. So you have this, this, you know, it was, I think surprising to them when they were coming in to just increase flexibility. And then the next two or three days, they couldn't walk because they were so sore from stretching so deep. Right. And, you know, they're cooked. And so it was like, what's going on? I thought this was supposed to, you know, help. And it was actually hindering in some ways. And then 
I don't know, it was probably maybe now six, seven years ago, uh, me and my wife, we were, we have this, this yoga teacher that we truly love and we're like, and she was doing this, this yin yoga teacher training. So we're like, you know, we're going to go take this. And it just like, it was that piece that we had been missing and even in the yoga world. And we just realized like, wow, this is so different and it's so much more as far as the recovery and just opening and creating that deep flexibility and mobility that we we're looking for, even in our own yoga practice. And so at the time when my brother starts introducing me to CrossFit, I just had typically always started doing the yin yoga before I went to train with him. Mm -hmm. And I started to realize when I didn't do that, I felt tremendously different. And when I wasn't staying up on the yin, it was completely affecting me in CrossFit. And so from that, I just started the conversation with my brother. And it took a while because I was, you know, I just didn't even, we, we always talked about how can we get, you know, CrossFitters to do more yoga and more stretching. And, and I guess it just took a while to actually realize like this yin yoga was uh, hopefully the answer. And it was the answer for me and then it was the answer for him. But, you know, we still weren't quite sure how the general public would take to it. Mm -hmm. And it just kind of emerged from there. It was really just getting away from the repetition, getting away from the heat, getting away from all these static, you know, squeezing, strengthening in positions that you do in vinyasa and going into more of a passive approach. So I'm, I'm, I'm very curious. And, and the reason that I wanted to do this in the first place is because uh, the first interview that we did, I wanted to kind of go deeper into some of the topics. And yeah. both of the guys just said, okay, over and over, you need to talk to Daniel, you need to talk to Daniel. So <laughs> right. um, I'm really excited to get more into the science of, yeah. you know, flexibility and mobility, if you will. And I know Absolutely. that you've, um, you've done a, a lot of training Yes. And uh, a lot of advanced training. So let's let's start here. What What's okay. going on at the physiological level with the long holds like it, that you find in yin yoga in Ramwad in your warrior routines, especially that doesn't happen with a 30 second to a minute long stretch? Yeah, this is this is one of the big take homes, actually, I think, within the program is that so typically as we kind of look at stretching that has been done when it comes to fitness, exercise in general, everything is 30 seconds. And there's this big like, you know, talk like, hey, you don't need any more than 30 seconds to necessarily stretch out for any specific activity. Within that, there's some truth as far as the, what's happening on a muscular level. So the, the real big take home with the yin yoga though is that when we're, we're looking to not only stretch the muscle, which it does, we're also targeting the connective tissue, which is a really, really big deal. So taking a look at the body, we realize that all tissues of the body need to be stressed to stay healthy, right? So whether or not it's muscles, whether or not it's your bones, your heart. And, and the thing is, is too, that also goes for connective tissue. So we're talking about ligaments and we're talking about tendons. We're talking about the fascia that truly is wrapped around all the muscles and intertwined through the body. And so the only way that we literally can target the connective tissue in the body is through passive positions that are longer than a minute, two minutes, to three minutes. As it, it's kind of more like this. It's like if you go put braces on, you know, you don't wiggle your teeth into position. You, the braces are like a slow yielding process over time. And that's a lot the same way that the connective tissue works. So if you're training, the connective tissue is very stable. But if you sit in a position and you sit there and you give it time, little by little it starts to yield and that is actually causing more of stress, you know, even more than considering it to be a stretch. And by stressing it, it's actually strengthening it long term. And, and why is that? Why does it take longer to get, to kind of get um, movement in those, t in that tissue? Is it, yeah. is it kind of a, a protection mechanism that it is, yeah. goes through or what? Uh, yeah, it's like this, it's the design, right? So it has what's called elastic properties. And so that means like if, if I do a fast you know, movement, or, you know, I'm weightlifting, I'm training, any of that stuff, the, the tissues are very stable because it's, it's, a lot, it's being protective of the bones, the joints, and, and what have you. And so it, it just it, it takes that two minutes and three minutes of that long, just kind of putting a little bit of pressure. I'm not being super active with it for that to actually cause it to start to, to yield. And so it's fascinating, really. And, and a lot of this stuff is, is, is really now, like the science as far as it goes, is, is beginning to open up. And people are really starting to realize, like, wow, this connective tissue is it, so important to target. And it's, 
And it's so difficult to target at the same time because it takes patience. You know, like it's not easy to sit there for two or three minutes. So it's been way overlooked all these, I, I don't know, you know, these far as years of training um, because there's not, there's that, I guess, maybe misunderstanding of how important it really is to sit there, wait, let it be stressed and, and cultivate that strength in the ligaments and the fascia of your body. Now, PNF stretching, and, and actually let yeah. me explain this for for anyone that doesn't know what it is, proprio neuro, uh, neuromuscular facilitation. So this is right. where, uh, you know, usually it's, it's partner stretching where you'll have a partner push down. If you're, if you're stretching your hamstring, they'll push down on your leg and you'll right. put, or you'll push against their hand and then you relax and they'll push you a little further. Then you'll push against their hand and then you'll relax right. and they'll push you even further. So PNF stretching has been shown to be, uh, a quicker way of getting into kind of a, a deep position, a deep stretch. And so right. I'm wondering, uh, again, from a physiological level, how does this compare to the to long poles, uh, pose holds? Um, is there one that's better than the other? How, how do you think about that? Well, and that's, you know, I think like there's a lot of good stretching programs out there. Like you said, the PNF is really good. Um, you know, even doing a lot of these dynamic and ballistic kind of stretches, if you feel safe doing them, those are fine. But again, all those different kinds of stretching uh, programs, they are targeting the muscles and they are kind of overlooked. You're, you're missing the fascia, the connective tissue mm -hmm. benefit. And so, you know, I actually, you know, I truly believe it's important to find a nice mix of both. You know, I mean, if you're going to if you're going to only do ROMWOD, it's in definition, it's actually a little bit of an incomplete system. So it's important to train and stress the fascia where, again, you still get that deep muscle belly stretch. But it's also important if you're if you're truly just looking to increase flexibility in a, in a faster period of time, and we're just going to target the muscles, you could easily go with PNF stretching or ballistic stretching, and you might find it to be a faster way to get there. Now, you know, and then you got to look at well, you know, faster may not be as necessarily safe. I mean, uh, there's definitely been a lot of injuries that could happen in like ballistic style stretching and sometimes in PNF stretching because it's challenging to work with a partner. You know, if you're if you're being pushed and you're squeezing and resisting in certain things, I mean, it's tough to know where those muscles are about to to go too far. Right. So I I do love the yin and that you're you're super it's super slow. You're sitting, you're waiting, and you're trying to tune into what you're feeling, and so that you can kind of adjust and work with it in a way that you know you're not forcing past your boundaries too soon. But again, you could still do PNF or ballistic with mindfulness, and of course, that'd be a lot more of a, of a better approach. Right. So kind of a, a, along those same lines, what what's going on when you say overstretching? Uh, what, what's actually happening when someone overstretches a muscle or, or even connective tissue? Yeah. So, I mean, you know, you have these little connected in the, in the muscle itself, these little like filaments and they're, they get pulled on. Right. And so if you kind of, if you go, if you keep pushing and keep pushing, they finally, they finally tear it really is what happens. And so even on a, a basic level of stretching, you know, you could have a lot of these little microscopic tears in the muscle that are really, you know, that's your, that's you going too far. And so if you're, if you're doing like a PNF or any kind of stretching program and you're really, really sore from it, you've gone too far. You know, you are, you're going past a lot of those boundaries. And so, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, on that muscular level, you know, there's, everything's connected and it's, there's tubes within tubes and a lot of these little tiny spindles and, that's where you're kind of targeting as far as in those kinds of stretching programs. Mm -hmm. When, when you're setting up your, um, I guess the weekly program or even monthly program, how, yeah. how do you ensure that you're not overstretching certain muscles and, and especially overstretching them in the same exact way? Cause a lot of times you'll, you'll do, you know, 10 different movements that all target the hips, uh, right. but they're all slightly different. So how do you go about deciding, how, you know, when and where to put things. Yeah. So, and that's, that's the other thing. So say we're targeting, like you said, like, let's just take the growing for instance, right? So in the growing group, we have five muscles. So if I'm going to be doing maybe what we call bound angle, that's where you're sitting down, feet together, knees are bent, leaning forward. This is going to target your growing group and your lower back. And then we could go into a frog position, which is still going to target your growing. And then you have a seated straddle and you have your standing straddle, you have your frag and pose. So the importance of the variance though, is that when you're targeting a muscle group, it's, imp it's impossible really to isolate that group with just one specific pose. 
And so it's important to constantly vary the approach. And even if you're going to do bound angle every day, I say this once in a while in the audio routines, it's like, look, you know, do it a little bit different, maybe every few weeks, you know, because what happens is if you just do your stretches the exact same way every single time, you're stretching just threads of the muscle group. So it's like I'm digging a trench into one part of the group, right? So if, I, if I'm super rigid in my stretching program, I'm not actually encompassing the entire group. And so it's really, really, like it's just, again, you gotta keep that variables. You gotta keep changing it up and changing it up. Now, that doesn't mean within a week, I mean, a lot of times you will see, we'll do multiple growing stretches, maybe one day standing straddle, maybe the next day seated straddle. But we do try to always continue to mix it up and, and give people different looks, even at the same target. And then again, if you're using the same pose, change up just a little bit how you do that pose. And so we try to encourage that. Um, if you do hit that muscle group too much over and over again, that's where you see like you're, you're digging a bigger trench and it's, it sets you up for, I guess it could be disaster injury really ultimately. Mm -hmm. how, how do you know? Uh, yeah. How can you tell if you've overstretched? Again, usually if you're, if you're overly sore, um, is really you, will you know now it's, and that's even tricky too. So if, if you're not used to doing passive stretches and the fact that we are stressing fascia, there is a soreness that comes with it and people will feel like, Oh my gosh, I'm so sore. And it's like, uh, you know, it might even be, it might last for a few months actually, cause they're not used to stressing the fascia. So it's, it's a, it, there's a soreness and it's hard to decipher that good sore versus that bad sore. And it's one of those things that you have to really tune into your body and try to really pay attention to how you're feeling. So that, that stressing soreness is just like if you're to work out, you know, a, your quadriceps or your biceps, it's, it's a little subtly different. The, it's more of a, I, I feel it when I'm overstretched on my muscles, it's not necessarily like a sharp acute pain, but it definitely falls in line with, uh, it's just subtly more painful instead of the stressing, the fascia, I feel is a little bit more achy and, and that's the best way. Like I feel the difference. And so it's like pain versus ache for me. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll basically just get sore if, if it's. Uh, you know, like especially one of the warrior routines, I'll be sore. But yes. if I get into, if I, you know, find myself like pushing into a stretch, um, especially if I'm like trying to warm up for a workout really quickly yeah. and I, right. that's when I can overstretch and then I'm, then I feel some pain. So I, I can definitely exactly. relate to that. Yeah. Yeah. It's subtle. Like you said, it's, it's, it's something that you have to really be intuitive with your body to know that difference because some people will be afraid of being sore from stretches like don't be afraid of that um this you know it's there's going to be some pain you know especially when you're not used to doing what you're doing i mean you're going to get sore from doing any kind of new training stretching program that you're not used to doing and so you have to understand that positive pain versus that negative pain right so what's the difference between all of this stretching and then stuff like smashing and rolling yeah. So again, it's, it's just a different approach as far as, um, you know, as far as what's actually going on on the, on the muscles and what's actually happening. And so, um, I actually still believe that fully, like, again, if you're doing raw mod, you still should be mashing and smashing. It's, it's rolling is, is very, very good for you at the same time. It's, um, as far as rolling out and, and all that kind of stuff, it's not necessarily my specialty. Um, but I, uh, I do believe that both are highly beneficial. Um, even at the studio, we have some, classes once in a while we actually have both integrated together which a lot of people like and so um you know subtly there's definitely a, a difference as far as you know the targets and the benefit um, some similar ideas but again the main concept though is that uh these holds like unless you're sitting uh, for two or three minutes and pinpointing um you know it's a different kind of pressure versus a stress i guess in some ways where it's like just the natural gravity is doing the stressing versus you know, an actual, like you're, you know, you're mashing, you're using a ball, a pressure point technique. So equally, definitely beneficial on, on certain levels. Um, but, uh, yeah, I think, you know, ultimately to do both would be the, the best way to go. Right. In so. The, so in this class that you have where you're doing yeah. both, which one do you do first and why? So per particularly in the class that is taught, they actually will do all this, the mashing first and they'll, they'll use the ball and the pressure points first. And so, um, and that's just, that's just the, the order of operation that they found that works the best. Mm -hmm. 
and so and I don't think that that would necessarily have to be now the only thing I would think though is if you do a raw mod routine there is some vulnerability in the fascia at least for a few minutes after so if you are completely opened up and then you go into pressure points and and you, maybe you could be setting yourself up to go too far with it possibly and so um but definitely like a an area that right now I'm like definitely looking into and studying and trying to get like a lot of, uh, I guess, um, a learning in this kind of a, this category. So mm -hmm. I'll see where it goes. I, I'm, it's interesting how some people love the combination and some people don't, you know, and, and there's like the two get kind of paired against each other a lot, like, right. you know, doing passive Absolutely. stretching and doing mobility work. And uh, like, I, you know, again, I think both are really the ultimate goal Mm -hmm. And they both they both definitely have a little different approach and different benefits, and so I think equally important. Right, and probably different um, different times. To use yeah, exactly, each. absolutely, um, definitely. So after you've sat in one of these long poses, you suddenly have all of this increased range of motion. Yeah. Why, so a couple things: why does it why does it go back into place after a couple hours, and then? Why does it take so long to make to turn this into permanent uh, increases and improvements in flexibility and mobility? Yeah, so actually, I mean, and not even it doesn't even necessarily take hours, right? So I mean, you could actually be pretty much ready to go for training even 15 to 30 minutes after, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of nice. But so again, you kind of look at it like the same way, I guess, if you if you're targeting your muscles and you're training by doing squats. You're, the immediate response to your body, whether it be cardio or muscular training, is going to be fatigue. So if I'm, if I'm going to train my heart, I'm going to go run. My immediate response is going to be elevated blood pressure, elevated heart uh, you know, rate. All that stuff goes up. The long term, right, as we know, is lower heart rate, lower blood pressure. Same thing with working out your, your legs. My immediate response is going to be I'm fatigued. They are, you know, I'm cooked uh, long term again is that they're stronger. And so the fascia actually is the exact same way. The immediate response is that there's vulnerability. I'm, I'm kind of in this very open state. I'm, you know, I'm wide open. There's that stress on the fascia. The same thing, that vulnerability, though, long term turns into I'm stronger and actually in my ligaments and my tendons and all the connective tissue within. And so it's, it's just that design of the body, really. You know, we stress it. The immediate response is there's that it's fatigued and it's it's almost like it has the opposite long term effect. Mm -hmm. And so, and from the studies though, it, like I said, the fascia seems to come back and is ready to go um, fairly quickly. And so, but usually I still tell people like, look, if you're going to do a raw mod before a heavy session, definitely give yourself like at least 30 minutes, 40 minutes before you you go at it, and right. go through a warm up as well. You know, right. so it's not like. You're not jumping out of a seat to straddle and then jumping right into a deep squat. Right. You know, so because there's too much vulnerability still. You don't want to go there. Yeah, there are a lot of studies. Out, they're outdated now, but there are a lot of studies that yeah. show static stretching before any kind of uh, power or ballistic movement will decrease your power output. But right. I think if correct me if I'm wrong, you, you'll probably know better at this point than me. Um, if you follow up static stretching like Ramwad with a dynamic warm up, uh, those those effects are mitigated, right? It has uh, it has uh, really no effect. That's what we're seeing for sure. And I and I agree, like a lot of these studies are they're so outdated and there's so many variables that probably they didn't take into play as far as, you know, people's body types and, and the different kind like how long were they actually holding and how quickly were they exercising afterwards. And, you know, again, how many times are they repeating the different stretches and the muscle groups? So I think there's a lot of X factors when those studies were done. And then they kind of like labeled like, look, all passive stretching should not be done if you want to keep power output. And it was like, whoa, uh, you know, but we look at the dancers, they're all doing passive stretching before they go out and do their show. And when they're doing their show, they're explosive. You know, they're fantastically explosive and powerful. Or the martial artists, same thing. You know, so we see this time and time again with anybody that needs you know, a deeper range of motion, um, that these passive stretches are highly beneficial and they're not losing any power output, you know, but it's, again, it's timing and it's going through a proper warm up, and it's, it's just having that awareness of knowing what you're doing and how to do it. Right. So, so I've, I've gone to yin yoga classes for years and especially after uh, my back surgery. And okay. I know that usually the classes are an hour 
Um, I'm not sure. So yeah, I'm curious. What what does a typical yin yoga routine look like at a studio? And, and really what I'm looking for is, you know, if, if someone wants to get as flexible as possible as quickly as possible and do so safely, does it make sense to do something like the warrior routine every day? Yeah, it's a, that's, a, that's definitely a trickier question. It's, it's definitely a personal one. And I think, again, it depends on, you know, each person's body is a little bit different. I think for some people, a warrior every day would be too much. Um, and for some people, it might be perfect. Uh, what we've kind of figured out, though, is that when we really start to study, like, okay, when is enough enough? When do we get the most benefit in the shortest amount of time possible? That's kind of like what we aimed to cultivate when we came up with our daily programming. We kind of shorten it down from about 12 minutes to 22 minutes. We, we realize, like, okay, we can target the major muscle groups and the, and the target areas in a way that it satisfies. There's openness and there's definitely an increase of range of motion, but you don't necessarily have to sit there for an hour or 45 minutes to get there. Um, when we found that we were doing the warrior routines, the 45 minutes to an hour, there, then we did start to see if we happen to do that before training, it was a little bit harder for the body to bounce back and be ready for, you know, necessarily like a strong training, like the power felt a a little bit different and so and that was just a lot of our experiences and the people we were working with but so we kind of came up with it's like look uh, to maintain the power we're going to target these groups we're going to try to condense it down to about 12 minutes to 22 minutes and we found that we didn't lose any of the power output we felt you know everyone stayed strong pring like crazy it was it was fantastic uh the 45 minutes we found the most benefit when we really were trying to use those on the rest days and that um, the day after that, we felt really, really amazing as well. So, you know, you have your day off, you do your warrior, but we still maintain out the, the power output. So, um, I don't think it's, it's necessarily a negative thing if you do want to do the warrior every day, if you're doing it probably after training or at night. Um, right. I think then that's fine. I think it, like, again, it's timing. So when we created the dailies that we wanted to make sure that, look, you could do this before, or you could do this after. We didn't want there to be restrictions on you had to do it after. So, you know, with that said, that's kind of where we condensed it down to make sure that it wasn't too opening for people before training. Um, and then, okay, if you're going to do the long one, do it at night or do it on the day off. Right. I mean, it, and also if you, if you had 45 to 60 minute routines every day, you know, you'd probably have a couple hundred people in the world doing it rather right, than, exactly. <laughs> with, you know, a hundred thousand. So, yeah, right. Uh, no, for sure, man. It's, and that was it, too. It's like, look, you know, we, we already are training in the boxes for quite a while. I mean, right. at least an hour, you know, and, and for a lot of the top half, at least, you know, it's, it's hours upon hours. And so it's like, you know, the last thing I think anybody wanted was like another 45 minute or an extra hour a day just on working on range of motion. And it's like, look, but we figured out like it, it's not necessary. You know, you, you don't have to, to go there um, unless you have the time to go there. And you know, and you find it very beneficial. I mean, the warriors are very beneficial, not only on the physical level, you know, as far as you have way more time, you can really get into all the target areas a lot more thoroughly. Uh, but even on the mental level, taking like a full 45 minutes to an hour out of your day versus 20, you know, it's, it's nice to be able to unplug as long as possible, you know, and give your mind that time to recover. But, you know, realistically, uh, people hardly have time for, you know, five minutes. So, right. You know, we we're like, all right, let's 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 find that minimum, and then we can at least go from there. Right. And but we have a lot of people that hit us up a lot. They ask us a lot, like, hey, is it okay if I do two a day? And of course, you know, absolutely, you could do two a day, or it ends up being about 40 minutes a day of of raw mod, mm -hmm. um, because a lot of people like to do it in the first thing in the morning, and then they go through their day, then they train, and they do it like either after training or at night, and that's fantastic. You know, that works out really well. Yeah, I, a uh, a physical therapist that I really look up to told me. I think around when I was getting my surgery, uh, he said, never get out of bed and go about your day tight and never go to sleep tight. So oh, I think I love that's it. phenomenal uh, advice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love it. Definitely. And, and again, that's, you know, a lot of the science as far as when we wake up, we're tight, we're sore. You know, the, the studies are now leading in a place where realizing that has a lot more to do with the fascia than it has to do with anything else. Mm -hmm. And so there's literally like a it's a liquid based gel that is surrounding the outermost layer of the muscle. So you got your muscles and they're wrapped in fascia, but even in between that outer layer of fascia and the skin, there's like a gel-based 
uh, it's like a liquid fascia actually it's probably mm -hmm. the best way and they're they're realizing that this has a lot to do with the way we feel when we wake up when we're sore when we're sick when we're dehydrated because everyone hears that your body's like 80 percent water but the truth is it's not like the water that we think of water in like a glass of water it's more of like a gel based water and this is uh it's a mixture of hyaluronic acid and and so this gel base reacts to training, it reacts to stress, it reacts to, you know, if you're sick. And so when you wake up and you're achy, they, they realize that this gel base actually becomes very adhesive and it even contracts. The, the fascia within your body actually has contractive property, just like muscles. You know, so when you're feeling tight, it's not just the muscles. It's like this, everything wrapped around your muscles is saying I'm tight and I'm sore and I'm adhesive. So doing the raw mud routines and stretching and warming up, it actually helps bring that adhesive state back to more of a, of a water-based state. And that's the fluidity. That's why, I mean, you look, like, look, you, you know, your muscles aren't going to change as far as your range of motion within a couple sessions or even a, even a single session, right? It takes a while, six, seven months for your muscles to really start to fully change. So why do we feel so amazing when we stretch? You know, if my muscles aren't really changing all that much, um, you know, everyone's like, oh, I feel so good after I do a Ramad. Well, it has a lot to do with the fascia. It has a lot to do with the gel soul balance of your body. Mm -hmm. You know, this is the stuff that's actually changing fast um, with the way, you know, when you're sitting there for two or three minutes, that's changing. It's actually coming back to a liquid state versus adhesive. So. Right. I can't wait until some people start slanging uh, fascia pills. <laughs> right, it's coming no out any day now. Oh, for sure. Yeah, I mean, people, do, you know, they do take hyaluronic acid already, and that's like kind of a that's one of those things that if if someone's like really really tight in their body, they will take hyaluronic acid, and that does actually help a little bit. Wow. Um, and so, but you're totally right, though. You know, there's there's this whole new science that's coming out about fascia and realizing like, oh my gosh, um, you know, it really has a lot more to do with fascia as far as the way we feel in the mornings, the way we feel on a daily basis. What do we get sore from training? Why are we so achy when we get sick? Uh, this fascia is a big deal. Mm -hmm. So it's quite fun, quite phenomenal. So you were talking about, you just mentioned that muscles can take six to seven months to change. Uh, I think connective tissue can take even longer. I want to say uh, about nine months. Is that, would you agree with that? I think it sounds right. Yeah. Again, I'm not sure the exact time. I, I've heard something in that realm as well. And so, um, yeah, going through the training, it was interesting. You know, it's like, wow, look, people don't realize that like, hey, it takes about seven years for you to reach your fullest flexibility, muscular potential. And that, right? means, seven years. that means going straight, right? <laughs> right. Seven years. Right. So when we're saying be patient, we're serious. Be patient. Right. So and the thing is, is, is that's, OK, so at some point, if I'm doing my Rama, if I'm stretching really consistently, persistently, Okay, five years, seven years down the road, I'm going to hit a point where I have worked through my muscles probably as much as I ever can. And then at some point, I'm now going to hit compression in my bones. And that is finally the point where I say, look, this is as far as I'm going to go, right? So some people that they come to us, they say, look, I want to be able to do the middle splits. Well, the first thing is like, well, look, either you have the bones for it or you don't. And there's no changing that. So that's the first thing. And sometimes people don't want to hear that, right? So, but the good news is that, look, don't make it about the splits, right? So why do we keep doing these passive stretches? Again, because it's targeting the connective tissue. You're getting so much benefit. Don't worry so much the aesthetics. Don't worry about dropping down to the ground. Like, you know, if you want your training to be optimized, your connective tissue has to be strong to support, right? You need to make sure, I mean, that's, that's where your prevention as far as injuries happens. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I mean, you think about any athlete that gets taken out of a career, it's, it's never like, oh, they had muscular problems, right? It's always there's knees, their, their elbow went out, their shoulder went out. It's always some kind of fascia bone related issue. And so, you know, this is why we're like, look, don't be dominated by, you know, these ideas that you're going to stretch for a year and you're going to be able to do these full splits and all these crazy yoga poses after a year. It's just not the case. Mm -hmm. You know, first of all, you have to work with your bones. Then, you know, you have to be patient for years to actually fully work through the flexibility of your muscles. And then even at that point, when you hit your compression, then you got to say, okay, I'm not going to jam past my compression, but now I'm going to sit and continue to stress the fascia in a healthy way so that I'm maintaining that Maintain strength. It, right. Yeah. You know, awesome, people, man. you know, yeah, it's, 
that, and again, that's not everyone doesn't always want to hear that, you know, like, oh, you know, like uh, even in the yoga world, it's like the, there's a mentality of saying that, like, look, do your practice and all is coming. And it's like, yeah, to a degree. Right. right. So, again, there, there is genetics that play into range of motion. If not, you know, it's, it's the biggest blind spot even in yoga. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it's like everyone's got their eyes closed to the fact that bones matter. And so, um, you know, then you get people jamming into positions and you're, you know, they're causing these deep compressions and they're, they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing. And that's leading up to injuries, you know, and so wow. the frustrate and, and frustrations, right? You're like, well, why can't I touch my toes? I've been stretching for 10 years. Well, right. you know, it's your bones. It's unfortunately. Do you guys, do y'all receive a lot of before and afters? You know, we do, we get a few. It's, uh, we definitely have like a hashtag ROM gains yeah. that's out there and, uh, you know, not so much in pictures. It's funny, like most of the success stories we get are definitely like just people like t- commenting, you know, they'll they'll just type in like, hey, like, you know, oh my gosh, I could finally actually touch my toes and mm-hmm. I could do this and I could do that. Um, you know, just the, the, the depth that they increase, you know, they usually talk about a lot. But there's, you know, it's it's crazy too. So say like, you know, we're doing a standing straddle. And I mean, honestly, when even when you cross over to performance, uh, you know, a half an inch will make huge differences in your training, right. right? So it's like sometimes it's like, you know, someone expects to go from a standing straddle to a middle split in three months. Well, look, like if you go two inches deeper, as that translates into a deeper squat, it, it's phenomenal what those tiny little extra inches and degrees can do. So, hmm. you know. So I have a few questions, and this is this is what you and I always end up talking about whenever yes. we see each other. What do you think it is? Mindfulness. Mindfulness. Yes, right. yes. The breathing. <laughs> yes. Love. The breathing. Yes. So, right. So, you know, I, I've told you I've meditated for five, coming up on nine years now, and, and it's just been life-changing to me. And so whenever – Whenever I first started doing Ramwad and, and saw that you incorporate so many breathing exercises throughout the entire thing, and then you even do a, an actual mindfulness practice at the end, I yes. was like, "Holy shit! These guys, <laughs> these guys have really got it going on, and they're you know they're connecting with thousands and thousands of people. This is amazing." Yeah. Um, and so you're you're very adamant about people focusing on their breath during the pose. Yes. What does absolutely. this actually do? So by focusing on your breathing, you're ultimately, in a sense, you're stealing your attention away from everything else, right? So if I, if I could find one point of focus, it leaves me very little room to continue to think about my history or to worry about what's coming, right? So I'm using just that simple, let me be aware of my breathing to, to ultimately, it's like a form of meditation. Let me focus on my experience that I'm actually having right now. Right. And so in that experiencing the experience now, I can make decisions on where to go with my body. Right. I can feel things better. I can I can find my place in the poses. Uh, and then also, too, like I'm sitting in a pose. I'm, a, I'm connected. And I realize at that point, too, like through that experience that, look, I could be really uncomfortable, but I don't have to necessarily stress out about it. And so it, it really just opens up the doorway to becoming completely present. And so, and it's a, it's a simple technique, right? Let me focus on my breath. Let me just pull my attention in. So why the specific counts, the eight in, 10 out, uh, and then 10 count holds for at the top and bottom? Yeah. So specifically, it's just trying to get people to, to use their diaphragm better to breathe, right? So a lot of people, and I mean, this is everywhere, are mostly what we call thoracic breathers. And so when we, when we try to breathe deeper in and exhale a little longer, it starts to help people understand you got to pull from the belly uh, to get those long, long inhales. You really have to start to suck from the diaphragm. And so it just starts to train people. Inhale up to eight. Exhales could be ten. Uh, we use uh, there's a very there's a few variables that we'll use. Well, sometimes we use, you know, like we'll, we'll have a, like a ladder where it'd be five and five, six mm-hmm. and six. Typically, though, you're right, though, it's eight seconds in, hold for ten, ten seconds out. And this is all just getting people to, you know, one, getting to, to breathe from the diaphragm better. And then two, it's also that simple technique of it's that form of meditation, right? So it almost takes you another step, right? So I'm counting, I'm focusing, I'm watching my breathing, and then I'm, I'm really training my body how to breathe from the bottom belly versus my lungs. Mm-hmm. 
So you've been incorporating more of the breathing at the end of the routines. What, what yeah. is the, um, explain the different nostril hold, <laughs> holding to me. Uh, right. The alternative nostrils. Yeah. It's tricky. Yeah. And these are just, these are, you know, techniques that we definitely pulled from the yoga world and, uh, you know, the simple techniques that just, they really help stimulate your nervous system to in a way that will help cultivate even more calmness. And so some of these techniques, like I said, you know, whether or not we're teaching them how to breathe from the diaphragm, the, the alternate nostril, I like that one because it stimulates the nervous system and helps people relax more. Um, but you know, they, they have, some of them can have subtle different uh, focal points, but in, and in most of these cases, when we do it at the end, I'm trying to take people into a deeper level of calmness and you know like the opposite of being stressed or anxious as that is just one more layer to help people achieve faster recovery and better performance you know so we're looking at now you can start to like study stress well how does stress affect my body and then i'm looking for techniques and ways how do i combat stress like how do i get out of the stress that i'm feeling and the anxiousness these breathing techniques are the body's natural way to do that it's your nervous system. It's the solar plexus. You start to stimulate these things and your body, that's the natural built in way that your body wants to relax. So how does the, how does this alternating nostril technique, uh, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm can't, can't think of the word, uh, stimulate the parasympathetic. Specifically, the science behind it, I, yeah. I, I, I don't actually probably specifically have the, the full rundown on it. Again, these, a lot of these techniques have been passed on through, uh, through my teachers. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I'd have to look into like, the actual scientific reactions um, as far as why that's actually happening. Um, I do know, you know the, the deep the sore plexus breathing, um, that does stimulate the vagus nerve. And so in, in many of these, it's almost like that has that same... You know, the, the end result is a lot the same as the vagus nerve. And so I do know that that is the main stimulation point and that that nerve helps cultivate the calmness and the, and the state of relaxing. Mm -hmm. And that's often missed in our just our regular thoracic breathing or unconscious breathing. And in a lot of ways, you know, we tell people like, you know, what we're trying to train you to do is, is breathe like a child. You know, if you look at a baby breathing, they breathe from their stomachs, they breathe from the belly. And then as we get, you know, as we get older and older, it becomes a lot more shallow and more thoracic. And so it's kind of the, the process of what happens. Do you know why that happens as we get older? You know, it's, it's probably just a matter of, you know, layering on the stress. And uh, as far as the aging process, you know, I mean, you got, uh, you know, probably gravity plays into it and uh, people's, you know, minds as far as, you know, the, the wandering and the, the stress of everyday living and all that kind of stuff, I, I believe probably is partly of why. Right. Um, you that know, people sense. don't, people don't take time. Yeah. I mean, they don't take time just to sit and focus on, uh, you know, like a nice meditative practice or a breathing practice and, uh, not, not to include also probably, you know, it has it to do with posturing, bad, bad posture and sitting all day and different kinds of things that probably play into it. Right. It, and it's kind of a, it's a, it's a cycle, right? Um, if we have negative or stressful mm -hmm. thoughts, that will affect our breathing and, and bring us more into like a chest breathing and mm -hmm. vice versa. If Absolutely. We, if we lose that, the, that belly breathing and we end up breathing through our chest, we can also signal um, that same feeling of stress, which then we start having stressful thoughts. And, it, you know, the, the cycle works either way. Oh, for sure. For sure. Right. Yeah. It's like, I mean, there's, there's, I know there's studies out there where they, they make people lie down and, and breathe a certain way. And, um, and also too, even just like your facial expressions, right? Like if you have a, a soft face versus a, a grit in your teeth and there's, there's these things are like, look, you can't stress yourself out if you breathe properly and stay soft in the face and relax in the mind. You know what I mean? Like you, you, it's almost like it's like, it's built in to stop you from stressing. Mm -hmm. So, but, uh, we lose sight of that a lot. Right. And it's, e it's easy to do. And so um, I think this was a, a nice, you know, it's like that benefit that you get from the program that we were definitely not sure how people would take to it, you know. And at first it was like almost like we're trying to sneak it on them, you know, yeah. like, hey, let's do some stretches. This is good for your fascia. This is going to make you perform better. And, you know, but to really take it deeper, deeper, realizing it's yeah, there's physical things happening. That's great. But that, that 20 minutes out of your day to help relax your mind 
is probably one of the most healthy things you could actually do for yourself when it comes to recovery and performance. Right. And just, you know? and just learning to be. Right. right. Exactly. Totally. Totally. Just sitting with the experience, right? Just be present. Um, and like I said, you know, we put it, we put people in difficult positions. Um, and then, you know, and I've seen you've talked about this before too. It's like, look, I'm really uncomfortable. Well, let me just observe that. Do I have to react to that? Mm-hmm. You know, do I have to do I have to be stressed out about that? You know, and so learning how to it's almost like you have a, a muscle right in your mind mm-hmm. that you're trying to train, which is the muscle of calmness, the muscle of non-reaction. Right. So right. everyone forgets to train that muscle. Right. So we train the body. We train all these other things. But we forget that, you know, calmness is like any muscle. You know, you have to put effort into training the ability to stay calm, peaceful, focus, just like you have to do anything. Right. Uh, a, a teacher I had recently said that we're trying with meditation, we're trying to create a gap, right? A gap yeah. between when we have a thought or a feeling and then uh, a subsequent reaction. The, the right. bigger that gap is, the more control we have over our reaction. Right. It's, I love that. It's so true, right? Which That's is space. powerful. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's, so, it's like a little bit of space in between it and everything's perspective changes, your understanding changes. It's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. So I have, I have one final question for you. Sure, man. Sure. Um, so you're someone that you, you work very hard in your yoga practice, uh, in, your, in your mindfulness practice, and now you have this business that is rapidly growing. You're, you're yeah. known throughout the world. Your voice is literally in people's, like, you know, tens or hundreds of thousands of people's ears every single day. Yeah. Uh, so my question is, how do you keep yourself grounded and, and how do you keep yourself from attaching too much to this success and notoriety um, and, and kind of letting it take your ego down a negative path, if you will? Yeah. And that's and that's so easy, right? I mean, it's such an easy thing to do to be like, oh, look, look what I've done. Right. Mm-hmm. So my approach has always been the same. Um, you know, I, I don't think I'm anything more than a vehicle, right? So I believe that, look, like, you know, we all have our gifts and we all have our, our purposes for what we're supposed to do on this planet. And so, you know, I look at it like, look, you know what, this came through me to share for people. It had nothing to do with me. You know what I mean? It was just something that I had to share and to try to, you know, not look at it like I, you know, I look at it like community. I look like, look, we all contributing you know, these things that we're going through and learning through the, you know, through our life. And, you know, it's for the, it's for the greater good, you know? And so, but you're right. The moment you attach your ego to it, you know what I mean? Then it just, it just loses that specialness, I believe, you know, then it becomes uh, tainted and polluted, you know? So, but it it takes, it takes practice. That's what it takes. You know, you got to sit down every day and and be aware. And then two, to, to realize, you know, we have a, a fantastic team, you know, it's, it's the community of our team that also is, is greatly responsible for the success, you know, and, and then to trust in the process of like, look, um, everything that is happening is just meant to happen. You know, it's like, I think we had a conversation one time last time we met, we we're saying, you know, you and you're saying you couldn't duplicate this probably at a different time if you tried, right? Like you could take the same people and put them in the same whatever, and you just couldn't duplicate because it's the timing. It's just like, it's that it's that trust that you know what everything is exactly meant to be and i am one piece in delivering you know whatever i can deliver to to help and uh you know help people grow and give people tools that will help their lives and so um that's the way i try to approach it um you know try to maintain that definitely like humility um because otherwise like i said i just it just gets kind of i don't know for me it just gets polluted and so i try to maintain that authenticness that's awesome man yeah. Thank you. Thank you. My All pleasure, right, man. What uh, you, do you do? You have anything you want to leave the audience with? Anything you want to ask them? Tell them? No, just that. Hey, like you know, uh, like I said, we have a fantastic team, and we're here to answer questions. Just like you know, you you threw a lot of questions my way, and people out there, they they do have questions, and I just want to make sure that they know that we are here, and we do uh, we always answer our emails, and if they go online, if they have any specific issues with the poses because i think the last thing i want anyone to feel is that they can't approach it because they're not flexible or maybe they have restricted bones Um, just to know that like look everything can be modified and this can adapt to anybody and so it's just a matter of being creative and and i'll actually ultimately is about being flexible in the mind 
And so, uh, but feel free to reach out if anybody has any issues and, and we're here for you guys. And where can they find you on social media? Is it at voice of Ram or Ram wide? Yeah. It's uh, well, our, our initial Instagram or social media is just Romwad. So it's R O M W O D. And then uh, I have a Voice of Rom. And then my brother is Jeremiah Head. So uh, we are there as far as to, to help. Hell yeah, man. Thank you so yeah. much for your time. This was, I appreciate it, Michael. This was great to get some of these questions answered, man. I've been wanting to do this for a while. No, I'm honored, man. I'm honored. I love what you do. So I appreciate being on this with you. Absolutely, man. Thank you so much. All right, buddy. We'll talk soon.